A lot of people have the misconception that Chinese characters are pictographs, that they are mini pictures of the thing they represent. While this is true in some cases, like in the character for door, tree, or man, pictographs actually account for just 5% of all Chinese characters. In this video, you'll learn how the other 95% of Chinese characters are constructed and how just one simple formula is key to understanding them. Chinese characters are cool, but you know what else is cool? Free giveaways! About a month ago, I partnered with italki to give away $50 worth of one-on-one -on -one language lessons to a lucky subscriber, and Paul was the winner of that giveaway. As you can see from his water bottle, he is clearly living in China right now, where he's actually a teacher at an international school in Guangzhou. With italki lessons starting at just $5 and thousands of native teachers to choose from, Paul will probably get quite a few lessons in. We'll check back with him in a little bit, but first, let's begin to decipher how Chinese characters are constructed, and it all begins with this book. This is a Chinese dictionary, and if we go back in time to 100 AD, we would be able to read the very first Chinese dictionary, written by a guy named Xu Shen. This dictionary not only listed the definition of 9,000 characters of the time, it also explained their origins and organized them into six categories known as liu shu, or six writings. But only one of these categories is the key to 80% of all Chinese characters. Try to guess which one. Four of the categories describe ways characters are created, and two describe ways characters are used. The first category is pictographs, xiang xing zi, which we already discussed. If you look at characters like ma, yue, or mu, especially in their ancient forms, you can easily see that they represent ideas visually. Pictographs are usually the most ancient characters and can only represent simple, concrete ideas. The second category is ideographs, zhi shi zi. They're like a step up from pictographs and visually represent a complex or abstract idea with a mark. For example, we can start with the character mu, which means wood, and visually represents a tree. If we add a line to the bottom, it becomes ben, which means stump, or base, or foundation in modern Chinese. Add a line on top, and it becomes mo, which represented the top of trees in ancient Chinese and end in modern Chinese, like in the word zhou mo, weekend. The characters for up and down were originally written like this and also fall in this category. The third category is compound ideographs, hui yi zi. These characters are the combination of two or more meaning components. For example, the character xin, to believe, is composed of a man radical and a speech, indicating that a person and their words ought to be trustworthy. Or the character for tears, which is a combination of your eyes and three drops of water. It's interesting to know that the traditional form of this character uses a different type of construction, the semantic phonetic compound, which is our next category. The semantic phonetic compound xing sheng zi are also a combination of two ideas, but one component is a meaning component and the other is a sound component. In the character fun, which means cooked rice or food in general, the left component is the food radical, showing the meaning of food, while the right component is pronounced fan, showing the pronunciation of the character. Then, do you know how to say the day before yesterday? How to say it? Yesterday? Um, yesterday? Um, yesterday? Um, yesterday? Hey there, nice to meet you. I know, I already watched uh, the videos you sent me, but how was the lesson overall? <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was good. You know, the teacher was very professional. She was really, um, you know, ready with lots of mm -hmm. questions and lots of really good content. Challenged me. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, it just made me realize that I need a lot of work with spoken, uh, with speaking. I think this is a really, it was, it was a really good experience. It forced me to do this. I've been kind of wanting to set yeah. myself up with something that forced me to get, you know, jump into the deep end and do it. I'm glad to so, hear that. I will enjoy my remaining um, uh, lessons. <laughs> Cheers. Thank you very much. I appreciate <laughs> oh. it. All right. Bye-bye. Take care, man. You too. Bye. 
And if you guys are a little bummed that you missed out on the giveaway, don't worry, there's still a chance to get a great deal at italki. You can use my code AB5 to get $5 for free when you spend $10 or more. This code is only available for the first 50 people who use it, so be sure to take advantage of this offer. And now, back to your regular programming. The last two categories in Liu Shu describe ways that characters are used, not how they're created. And they are mutually explanatory characters, and alone characters. Mutually explanatory characters are honestly difficult to explain and doesn't occur very often. It explains a phenomenon when one character evolves into two different characters over time or across different regions. For example, Kao and Lao were originally one character meaning the long one, but one went on to mean a measure of aptitude, aka to test, while the other went on to mean long in age, or old. Long words seem to naturally occur in any language, so this is not a surprise at all, but long words are inherently challenging to decipher because by nature, they don't have to make sense. Like the word soju, which is loaned from Korean, which is loaned from Chinese, and makes no sense at all in English unless you look at its origins. So let's take a look at a super common character like wo, which means the pronoun I or me. If you look at it visually, it doesn't seem like anything that would indicate oneself, and that's because when this character was created, it had absolutely nothing to do with its current meaning. In fact, you may have noticed it looking a little bit like a couple other characters. That's right, the war character actually represented a weapon of war. And yes, I have a picture. This spearhead-like thingy with three sharp blades would have been mounted on a pole and used to kill people. Talk about a dark past. But on a brighter note, out of the six categories we just discussed, you only need to understand one category to decipher 80% of all Chinese characters. And that category is the semantic phonetic compound. These characters are by far the most common and follow a simple formula. One component that indicates meaning plus one component that indicates pronunciation. Just understanding one of these two components will drastically help you learn characters, and understanding both would be a huge advantage. If you understand the semantic component, which is usually a radical, it'll help you to remember characters that are related in meaning. Like if you know that the mu radical indicates wood, then the characters for tree, chair, village, and school will make sense to you. You'll notice that a bunch of weather-related characters had the rain radical, like cloud, frost, snow, and fog. A bunch of language-related words have the speech radical, like language, speak, thank, and invite. Verbs done with your hands have the hand radical, like touch, hit, pick up, and lift. Verbs done with your feet have the feet radical, like kick, jump, step on, and run. Sea animals have the fish radical, like shark, whale, carp, and cod. Insects have the bug radical, minus some incorrect classifications from our ancestors. And finally, if you understand the phonetic component, you can predict the pronunciation of unknown characters. For example, this character is pronounced qing and means a green or blue. And these characters are pronounced qing. Qing, 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 qing. This character, bao, means bag, and these characters are pronounced bao, 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 pao, pao, pao. Or just look at the many groups of characters with matching phonetic components. Qian, jian, jian, ba, 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 ge, ge, xi, xi, cai, cai, cai. But the problem is, you can't always rely on the system to interpret new characters you encounter. The semantic component is usually a good general classification of the character, but the phonetic component is only accurate a fraction of the time. The cherry-picked examples I used are only the best cases of semantic phonetic characters. The next issue is that they are sometimes outdated. For example, the character she is a perfect example of a semantic phonetic compound. The radical indicates speech, and the main component indicates the pronunciation, zhe. This character next to it looks similar, so you might presume that it follows the same convention. Except you'd be wrong. The first reason is because this character was poorly simplified with the meaningless placeholder yo. But even if you looked at the traditional form, you still wouldn't be able to decipher it. Because it is, in fact, a loan word. Yep, this character originally meant a type of bird. Absolutely nothing to do with its modern meaning. 
The final limitation, if you're still a beginner, is that the phonetic component may not be common enough for you to know it at your current level. What I mean is that a very common character like Chang might follow the semantic phonetic pattern perfectly, but the phonetic portion is actually a pretty rare word that you probably won't encounter until much later. The previous example, she, also uses a rare phonetic component, but at least it's used in a few other common characters, enough that you can pick up on the pattern even if you don't know what it means. But when you do reach an advanced level, you'll find that a lot of scientific words in Chinese are super easy to understand. For example, plants and animals. The name of almost all trees in Chinese follow the semantic phonetic compound to a T. Bai, feng, song. They all use the wood radical followed by a very common component that hints pronunciation. And have you seen the periodic table in Chinese? Almost all of them have the gold radical to indicate a metal. And if we take a look at this row and look at the phonetic components individually, you can see how easy it is to predict the pronunciation of an element you've never seen before. You could say that this is more of a pattern and less of a rule, but at least now you know how native Chinese speakers are sometimes able to guess the meaning or pronunciation of characters that they don't know. And it really is no more than an educated guess, and it's impossible to guess correctly 100% of the time. But it is an important concept for you to understand and will help you learn Chinese characters faster. So I'd encourage you to go through the characters that you know, even if it's just a few hundred, and try to find the semantic phonetic compounds within them. I'll bet you there's a lot. Until next time, happy learning. Peace out.